We are fortunate to have Mr. Vance Saunders presenting for us today. Mr. Saunders has had a distinguished career uh, in the Air Force, working with um, uh, Ball Aerospace for many years. He was their chief technology officer. Um, he's been involved in cybersecurity uh, in industry um, and has had lots of practical experience as this thing that we now call cybersecurity has kind of evolved and as as it's become an important part of all of the computing that we do. He's the director of our cybersecurity program at Wright State University um, and has been a real advocate for getting cybersecurity throughout the computer science curriculum and in fact uh, throughout the entire curriculum no matter what you're majoring in and that's kind of the topic of our um, talk today is that cybersecurity is everyone's responsibility. So it's a pleasure to have Mr. Vance Saunders here. Thank you, Vance, for, for agreeing to do it. And with that, I will be quiet and let you take over, and I will watch the chat window for questions. Well, thanks, Mike, and welcome, uh, everybody. Um, so cybersecurity is everyone's responsibility. Does anybody want to take a crack at why we why that's the title and why I believe that's true right now? Am I allowed to type two? Sure. Cool. Anybody? If not, we'll jump into it and and um, see, talk, chat about this a little bit. Uh, but that's um, I'll come back and ask you that uh, again in just a little bit. So um, I thought that what we do is look at um, the, the the two main topics. We'll talk about this cyberspace is a different thing because that's the foundation for. The cybersecurity is everyone's responsibility, but then I don't want to leave us hanging. There's a whole bunch of stuff that we can talk about, some things that we can do um, in stepping up to our responsibility, and we can look at those uh, as time permits. So cyberspace is different. So I love to start off. Eric Schmidt, um, for those of you that aren't familiar with the name of this particular Eric Schmidt, was he was the CEO of Google. He was chairman of the board for Alphabet. Um, so he's been in the tech business a while. And but clear back in 1997. Now 97 is like a couple years after the internet really exploded. Um, made a statement that the internet's the first thing that humanity has built, that humanity doesn't understand the largest experiment in anarchy that we've ever had. And that's in 1997, and that is the most amazing statement to me. Now I took some literary license with this quote and changed the internet to cyberspace. Okay, but this statement I contend is true today. We built this thing. We know that all this technology and this thing that we call cyberspace and the internet and all that stuff, it's all man-made. We built it, okay? And yet we really don't understand it. And therein lies part of the foundation for why I think um, we get to the point where cybersecurity is everybody's responsibility. Um, and so a couple of the things I want us to take away from this um, is to understand some of the reasons, and we're gonna get into those, um, and the challenges associated with securing cyberspace, understanding what cyberspace is, because if you don't understand what your domain is, it's pretty hard to work in it. And then to recognize that a lot of the, the ways we've done things in the past aren't necessary and sufficient for dealing with what we now face in cyberspace today. And it changes, we have to get a mindset change, and we'll talk a little bit about that as we go through this. So, um, the definition that I use for cyberspace, and cyberspace touches everything, and I think most of us are pretty aware of that now. Um, we know we have to use electronics, and we knew we mess with data, we have network systems and physical infrastructures. That's the part, the internet, if we want to, uh, as a good example, not the only thing, okay? Um, that's the part everybody thinks about for cyberspace, the computers and the networks and the data and that kind of stuff. But it is also can be thought of as the interconnection of human beings using the computers and telecommunication without regard to physical geography. And it's this human piece that is the most exciting piece and also the most challenging piece. And it's the piece that we technologists have kind of overlooked and left out of the equation in the past. So I love this definition. And as we all know, cyberspace does touch everything. Planes, trains, automobiles, satellites, submarines, power grids. I mean, it's not just the internet anymore. And then again, there's what, 7 billion people on earth and they say that somewhere four and a half to 5 billion of us are uh, connected to um, cyberspace at any, at some time. Um, and so then there's a whole bunch of us. Um, 
cyberspace and so, some people think that cyberspace is probably the most complex system that exists out there. So complexity, as it says, is generally used to characterize something that has many parts and those parts interact in ways, multiple different ways, many of which we don't necessarily understand. And so the important thing to take away from this, I love this picture of cyberspace. Here's the mini network, which is just one of the infinite number of stars that are in this internet galaxy, okay? So here's this super complex thing, okay? And we recognize that complexity is orthogonal with security. The more complex something is, the more difficult it is to secure. And so if cyberspace is the most complex or one of the most complex actually system of systems out there, then to think of it in the traditional security mindset, uh, my content doesn't make sense. And it's only going to get crazier because of the exponential growth in technology that's going to continue. Uh, from everything from the Internet of Things to clouds to our autonomous vehicles and robotics and blockchain and the inordinate amounts of data that we collect, the fact that we've got both 5G and 6G coming down in the next couple years, okay, we've got all the AI stuff, we've got the quantum stuff, but probably the craziest thing that has happened is that this data is now the new gold or the new oil the most valuable thing out there and this is this is data that none of us ever thought would be of interest to anybody i mean we understand classified data we understand intellectual property i mean the, the value in that data but what value was my shopping habits or what i like to eat or where i like to socialize or 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 okay and yet that data is getting gobbled up as quickly as possible because of its its value um and then um, a term that I came up with to help identify four characteristics that are unique, I think, to cyberspace when are combined um, are this thing called I call sorry cyber taco threat, access, change, and op cycle that also uh, present some challenges that we've never experienced before. So, in my previous work experience, um, we did. Um, testing of software, we did analysis of systems, um, and anytime we did that, we knew who the bad guys were. There was a handful of bad guys. In the cyber world, as we mentioned just a minute ago, um, depending on your source, somewhere between four and five billion people are active on the internet. And because technology is so cheap, Everybody can be there. Back when I was doing all my analysis, you had to have major resources. I, I'm talking about nation state resources to be able to, to threaten others in any type of space. That's not the case today. And so when you start to do an analysis from a threat perspective, you start off by having potentially billions of bad guys that you have to take into consideration. Now, you're going to eliminate those a bunch of those bad guys as you go through things, but you still have to start with the fact that, and we recognize this when we look at the hackers and stuff that are out there, a lot of those are individuals or groups of five, 10, you know, 15 type, type people. And the reason I put this picture in here is when we throw all these big numbers around, okay, billions, oh, yeah, okay, so there's 4 billion bad guys. But so I always love to let students conceptualize the kind of numbers that we're talking about. Okay, so here's 1 billion pennies, right? 1 billion pennies is five school buses, okay, of pennies all stacked together. Just 1 billion, and we're talking 4.5 billion. Anyway, okay, um, so access, or, yes, access. So we already talked about the fact that cyberspace um, is so, um, complex okay um so we have oh let's see depending on your sources there are 31 billion internet of thing devices that are supposed to be all connected in cyberspace by this year 2020 there's 1.7 plus billion websites active at any given time 14 billion mobile devices 2 billion computers all as part of this thing that we call cyberspace. And those are all access points into this complex thing that we're calling cyberspace. 
Okay. And so everything being connected like that, you can't even identify all of the possible access points, let alone close them all down. And now, oh, by the way, that's the mindset that we used to have was if you can close all the doors to your building, then you make it secure. Well, we have 48.7 some billion doors into cyberspace. And like it says, Toto, I don't think this is, uh, we're not in Kansas anymore. We're in an area we've never been before. Um, the C in CyberTaco stands for change. This is probably the hardest thing uh, that we have that we have not done a, a good job um, dealing with because we've never experienced it before and we're still not doing a good job dealing with it. Okay, we, um, as it says here, time to implement. Okay, that's the good guy trying to build something. Can't keep up with the pace of change. And so the bad guys are always ahead of us. Our defensive techniques are out of date and obsolete shortly if not before they ever get implemented because things change so fast we can't even maintain realistic and current threat environments because we spend all the money putting an environment together that we can go test and run experiments on and do everything else and then we find out that that's not even current or relevant anymore and this pace of change applies in all domains we struggle with it in education we struggle with it in business we struggle with it from a development uh, manufacturing perspective. Um, the, the explosion, as it says here, technology changes exponentially and we change either logarithmic, excuse me, literally or logarithmically, but not near as fast as technology does. And we don't know how to deal with that. And it causes tremendous amounts of challenges. And then the last thing, which on its own is not, just, is not unique to cyber being that the operation cycle or the decision cycle is faster than we humans can can process things. Now, there's lots of things that happen in millisecond times and nanosecond times and things like that. But when you look at cyber in the context of all of the other challenges, what it means is we have to automate stuff and we have to put this AI stuff into place and things like that. And now you get into issues about, well, okay, how much, what kind of decisions am I gonna let machines make? Am I gonna let them pull triggers on weapons and kill people or not or 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 and so this is another whole area that we have to deal with as and as technology continues to explode and things get faster and we collect more data and again 5g and 6g and all these technologies come in okay we're only the the exponential curve is just shooting right out into the into the stratosphere and we've got to figure out how to get our hands around that and then the other one that's kind of interesting that a lot of people don't think about is um, the old world colliding with the, what I call the new world or the physical world uh, that we were born into um, with the new world that, I, that is cyberspace. Okay. And so from an involvement, what I mean involvement is your involvement in the physical world, you had no choice about. That was all up to your parents. But your involvement in cyberspace, you have complete choice about. And not only that, but you have to make a conscious action to even enter into cyberspace. From a laws and constraints perspective, there are physical laws that we count on and rely on in the old world. Okay, I don't worry about anybody being able to jump off the face of the earth and go up and touch the moon. Because there's this thing called gravity that keeps us tethered to the earth. And so I don't put a lot of things in place to keep people from jumping off the earth and trying to touch the moon. But where, where's gravity in cyberspace? There are very few natural, consistent, reliable constraints in cyberspace that we can that we can that we can use. And so, as soon as we put something in place that we think um, is a defensive technique, because this is a, an artificial, we made it environment, I can just go change it. And there's very few things. Um, we do have some things. Um, the speed of light is a limiting factor. Okay. Um, the thermal properties of how fast we can uh, computers can run. I mean, there are a couple of physical constraints that we use, but nothing like we have in the old world. But probably the more detailed things, the access to people. All right, in the in the in the physical world, how many people do you know? Or how many people do you access at any one time? Or over your lifetime, how many people have you accessed? Hundreds, thousands, if you're super popular, if you're an evangelist or somebody like that, maybe tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands. Okay. How many people can you right now get, can you access in cyberspace? 
hundreds of thousands, millions, billions. And that's an amazing power that we, again, don't know how to put our hands around. What about access to information? General information in the old world, books and papers and TVs and stuff like that. What kind of access to information do you have in cyberspace? And it's crazy. And the other thing that you have to remember is that the data in cyberspace doesn't ever go away. What about the information about other people? How much did you know about your neighbors or anybody else without a whole lot of digging and a whole lot of work in the old world? How much detailed information do you know about people? Not very much. How much do you know about in cyberspace? Well, a whole lot more than most people know or would be comfortable about. And again, that data sticks around forever. So when you think it's cute to take your selfie, um, you know, getting tipsy at a party, smoking things you shouldn't smoke, doing silly things you shouldn't do because you think it's cool when you're in, you know, college or you just get out of college or you have some reason to celebrate. And then that comes back to haunt you 10 years later when you're interviewing for a job. Um, something that we have to, you have to think about in cyberspace. And then the other thing, because data sticks around forever in cyberspace, one of the being human and making mistakes is that we forgive and forget and time being a healer of all wounds are very important attributes that allow for very successful relationships in the old world. And those same attributes don't apply in cyberspace because you don't ever have to forget. Um, physical boundaries, again, in all the different cultures, I think there's some interesting stuff there. There aren't any physical boundaries in cyberspace that I'm aware of, even though we we try to establish them. Certain countries try to to limit what their citizens can do, but as we've seen, um, there's lots of ways to get around that. And then the whole law enforcement thing is if you do something um, illegal in cyberspace, it's real hard to get nailed for it. So cyberspace is different. And therefore, we get into this bit about why is this everybody's responsibility? Um, so three real quick realities. First of all, cyberspace is so complex, and I think we've talked about that, and we can see that now. Okay, so it's impossible to keep it safe and secure. The bad guys already have access to all your personal data, all of it. And that any data you share with a company will most likely be hacked, lost, leaked, stolen, or sold, usually without any fault of your own because you have to trust all these other people to help protect your information. Okay. And I don't know if anybody's ever heard of Brian Krebs. Um, he is a respected cybersecurity blogger. Uh, he's not a technical guy. But I, um, I think he's a journalist by trade that got into the cyber business way back when and is has kind of self-educated himself. But, and so part of this information came from, from Krebs. But his view is that once you've owned these the three realities that we just talked about cyberspace is so complex all your data is already out there anyway and any new data you put out there isn't going to get protected by the people that have it then expecting anybody else to safeguard your security is as he says a fool's errand and therefore you do take on the responsibility yourself so in one context of why is cyber everybody's responsibility is because you need to step up and be responsible for your own stuff, okay? And so that leads to this idea of we need a new approach. And this new approach is based on the same approach that we ended up using in the medical community. And that was um, we in the medical community realized that there were never gonna be enough doctors to stop every sniffly nose and every cold and every canker sore and every splinter or that ever happened to human beings. And so we said, look, we're going to teach a set of physical hygiene standards that will eliminate a lot of the not so serious um, health issues and allow us, the experts, to focus on um, the cancers and um, the really serious health issues. And we need to do the very same thing in cyberspace. Okay, we, depending on what source you read today, we're anywhere from 1 million to 3 million cybersecurity um, experts and professionals short. And the reason for that is I contend for the large part because we still have a mindset that cybersecurity professionals and technology are the things that are going to come save the day and make cyberspace secure. 
And I contend that that's never going to happen again. And that we have to then start talking about cyber hygiene the very same way that we talk about personal hygiene. And um, as it shows on this particular chart, um, some of the ways that you can do that are through things like least privilege by dividing up complex things into smaller pieces using um, data encryption and multi-factor authentication, keeping your patching updated and things like that. That is the primary um, thing I wanted to talk about. Um, there are a bunch of things that you can do so to step up to this responsibility. I am going to go through them very, very quickly you know, and then make the slides available for anybody that wants them, but a couple things to think about. Uh, mobile security. The biggest problem with mobile security, you don't, they're easy to lose. Mobile devices are small and they're easy to get left behind and lost. And so you need to have a plan in place to know what you're going to do if and when you lose your mobile device or get stolen. And then after that, everything is pretty much the same. Update your applications, encrypt your data, etc. But there's a mindset about mobile data or about, excuse me, mobile devices that we don't take and make the same um, commitment to that we do our computers and our desktops and even our laptops. Uh, Multi-factor authentication. This is a great chart. Here's a whole bunch of sites that um, will implement at least two-factor authentication. Um, there's a website out here that tells you how to use it. Um, use multi-factor authentication. Um, call in security alerts on yourself. There's ways that you can uh, both call in a fraud alert as well as security freeze. And then all of the credit bureaus um, will help keep people from um, stealing your identity, opening stuff on your uh, behalf and things like that. And then there's all kinds of day-to-day -day stuff that you can do from, you know, collecting your snail mail, looking at your receipts. I mean, there's just pages and pages of stuff um, that can all go out there. And this is all stuff that every one of us can do. This doesn't require, I mean, anybody can be taught to do these kind of things. Um, I'm done sharing. This is question and answer time for anybody that has them. Thank you very much, Mr. Saunders. I have a question to start us off. And while I ask if anyone else has one, please go ahead and type it into the chat window and we'll address it. So I wonder what your thoughts are. One of the things that I worry about is that uh, you talked about mobile devices and, you know, it kind of used to be the case and, and still is on PC networks that uh, that the network is only as secure as its weakest link. Yep. Um, and so if, if I have bad cyber hygiene on my PC, I'm not just exposing my own data, I'm exposing the data of everyone else at work um, who's connected to that PC. And so now I, I kind of wonder if that's still true in the age of cell phones. And you mentioned things like um, uh, multi-factor authentication. Are we putting too much? I mean, my multi-factor is on my phone which is also where my password manager is, which is also where a lot of my private data that you could use to answer all kinds of security questions are. Um, is, there, is there an alternative? You know, when we do multi-factor, we mostly use our phone. Is there a better way or is that still considered the best way to protect yourself? Well, so let me distinguish between multi-factor and two-factor. Uh, because multi-factor, you can you can add additional things to it. So, in a, a two-factor approach, which is like when you get your codes and things like that, um, I still like that. There are there's different opinions about that, um, but there's also um, the whole biometric aspect of things, okay, um, out there. But probably the most important thing is a mindset thing. We have to teach. We have to approach cybersecurity as a risk management exercise. And we don't normally think of it that way. Even and everybody gets all freaked out when people say risk management, and they don't realize that they everyone does risk management every day of their lives when they think about what it is they want to go do. Every decision you make is by definition a hypothesis before you don't know if you've made the right decision until after you've made it and you see the results. That, that goes with everything. Now you have high confidence that a lot of the decisions, when I go get ready to brush my teeth, I'm pretty confident I'm not gonna stab myself in the eye with my toothbrush. And so I don't have a whole lot of, of things to prevent myself from stabbing myself in the eye with my toothbrush in place because 
that's not, I don't view it as high risk. Still a possibility. I could still sneeze or something could happen that could cause that, but that's a pretty low risk. The reason I'm bringing this up is how you go about implementing multi-factor authentication depends on what you have on your devices in the first place. Okay, and you need to consciously go through and think that. Think about how do you do your finances? Think about how do you protect your personal information, your um, social security number, your credit card numbers? Um, how do you protect the physical pieces of property that are important to you? How many locks do you have on what doors? Do you have fireproof boxes that you put your passports in? Do you have um, a safe deposit box someplace that you put your marriage license or birth certificates or things that are just super critical that you can't get back any other way? We need to think about digital information the same way. And then if you want to put everything on your mobile device, okay, uh, then you have to search, take the time to search out um, enough of the um, security op, um, tools available to make yourself comfortable. So I, again, um, I love Two factor the two factor authentication and the texting. I mean, just getting the text um, numbers right from everyone. Um, I think works great. Yep. If somebody steals my phone, guess what? That's not going to do. That's not. Then they're going to get access to that because they're all sent to my phone. Okay, got it. Okay. But if somebody steals my phone, they're getting a whole lot more than my multi factor authentication things, right? Okay. So. There's a mindset change, and this is all part of the cyber, I argue, the cyber is everyone's responsibility aspect of it, is we have to step up and take responsibility for our own stuff and recognize what and recognize what is there and recognize the risk and then decide how we want to participate based on that. I'm not a person that likes to have my face plastered all over the internet. You could count the number of selfies that I have taken, okay? on probably two hands. Um, you compare that to my granddaughters who, or granddaughters, that's not fair. I have a grand, a couple granddaughters who are very open with um, sharing the stuff that they do in the world as on the internet. Okay, trust me, their grandfathers talked to them about the risks associated with that and made them think about it so that they're at least aware Make your decisions and go on and live your life. And then if something happens, detect, react, and adapt. And that's the way we live our lives. Okay, if you get in a car, you don't anticipate a car accident. You decide what safety features you want in your car. You decide whether you wear a seat belt or not. Okay, you don't anticipate going out and getting in an accident. If you get into an accident, then you react and recover from that accident based on its seriousness, based on what happened, and think about ways of present, preventing it the next time. I have one more question, and then I'm gonna invite everyone, like I said, uh, while I ask it, if you've got any, to go ahead and type them into the chat. And at the end of this one, if I don't see any in the chat, we will go ahead and wrap it up. Um, so, so one of the things that I'm acutely aware of when we talk about cybersecurity, is that in the modern age, all of our wealth that we've accumulated, our bank account and any investments and whatever money you've got, isn't money anywhere. It's just a bunch of numbers on a machine. Now, amazingly enough, somehow there have not been a lot of instances of people being able to generally just go into the banking system, despite the fact that it's obviously one of the most you know, tempting targets and just start transferring my life savings over to themselves because they know that that's just stored out. It's a bunch of bits on a server somewhere. Um, so what are they doing right in the banking system that we're not managing to do in the rest of cyberspace? Because you know, credit card numbers and, and accounts and all these other things are hacked all the time. And you showed a slide of all the different sizes of all the different break-ins um, that have occurred recently. And we're doing a terrible job of keeping hackers, um, uh, intruders out of systems in general, but yet we've somehow managed to keep them out of the banking system. What's, what, why? What's the difference? Well, I, so um, I think there's multiple answers to that. Encryption is one. 
but I think the the um, the way they have designed the networks, I think there's a segmentation approach that they use so that it is difficult to connect um, a social security number to actual dollar values um, without um, knowing how that connection is has been architected. Um, so, um, and I think those are two of the biggest areas that I'm aware of um, from uh, from their implementation um, perspective. Um, Why can't we do that in the rest of cyberspace? What is it that? Can. You have to be motivated. You have to have, you, you can, but it takes, it takes, um, it, okay. It takes a, I have responsibility for protecting this data, my life or my, if I'm the bank, my business um, relies on, I mean, this is my job. You're entrusting your, your information to me. Banks have understood the importance of that information from the beginning. Other businesses don't appreciate that information because data, we understand that the value, that the, that the data that is in banks, that has always had value. When has someone, again, when has someone's eating habits, when has somebody's address ever been important in the, in, in context of needing protected in the past? Right. It hasn't. And so I, you're telling me that I have to protect this PII, personally identifiable information, okay, which someone else is dictating to me. And so, okay, fine. I will meet that, not because I believe it's important and needs to be protected, but because you're telling me that I have to comply. And so I think it's a mind, it's a mindset thing. We don't know. Data is now, as I said, data is, is the new oil. We don't know how to protect it. Understood. Yeah. So it's a question of it's a question of priorities, investment, and sort of the continuum between protection and then using using that data. Exactly. And and it goes back to what Krebs said. If you if you're gonna rely on somebody else to protect your data, you're fooling yourself. So step up. I mean, just like who's responsible for protecting your family? Oh, well, uh, please, Mr. Policeman, watch. I'm just going to let my kids go play in the street, and I'm going to count on the police uh, to keep them from getting hit or anything else. Come on, stop. Right. Okay. But yet, that's not the mindset we have for this data stuff and, and for technology in general in this area. And that's that's what we have. We have to step up to our own responsibility because for two reasons. One, not only do we hurt ourselves, but the fact that we can hurt other people too. And so... You know, part of the physical hygiene on the medical side isn't just that you implement physical hygiene, but then there's social pressure for others to comply, right? And we have to make that same thing happen on the cyber side. It's like, and man, you want to talk about physical hygiene? What a wonderful time to be talking about that right now. Right. Okay. <laughs> right. All right. So we have to have that. We have to have a mindset that says. Okay, you know, be responsible for your stuff, but also recognize your actions can have impact on other people that other people might not like. I am not seeing any other questions. I do want to point out a couple of things. First, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us. We welcome you to join us again, bring your questions, invite anyone you know who might be interested in joining us. And once again, we really appreciate having you here with us and Hopefully for at least some of you, we'll get to meet you face to face in person if we haven't already in the fall. Um, so thanks again, Vance, very much appreciate it. Thank you everyone. Have a great weekend. Have a great uh, summer. Yep, for sure. And we'll hope to see you all again very soon.